Okay, and so to, to kind of go back and reweave the first conversation, to kind of just duplicate it, come at it at a different angle. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, Anton confuses anthropocentrism with logocentrism. I don't think he's made a separation between the two. He hasn't substantiated a basis in which to speak about logocentrism. And all I'm saying is this, is that one can successfully escape anthropocentrism if, let's say, your god is a beetle and you don't have human uh, entities to it, you don't, or uh, attributes that you grant to it. And, uh, and, and, but you identify with it. That's anthropocentrism, but he's saying uh, logocentrism. How do you escape the language? And he's basically saying language being a human aspect, therefore we're going to call that anthropocentric. But what I'm suggesting is that when language goes on vacation in your conscious state, you can still have sympathetic uh, uh, interactions with other animals, with with the with, with your environment, with the weather. Um, it, it's it's more. It feels as if now you are more like an animal when language goes on vacation because you're moving and you're doing things that appear to be simply based strictly on your senses. Of course, this is all known retrospectively. When you're in that mode, you can't use any of these words. Just like I'm using these words and Anton might come back with, but look at uh, you're using the words to describe it, right? In, in kind of this this yeah i don't in, in this platitude right and and that's known he's not he's not fooling anyone with logic you know uh, or capturing them uh with this logical game but the whole point is is when language goes on vacation and you you find that your body's moving like an animal right like these other animals that we are so closely related to that we uh, live with but we also bond with then that part of that identification is what we're calling sentience not just the suffering not just ganglia and neuro pain but actually the uh, the, uh, the sympathetic it's almost like the sympathetic nervous system is still active whether or not there's words okay and so logocentrism is basically to say all words point to or defer to other words but you can have a signifier a word pointing to things outside of the language, kind of like Anton might point to, uh, yeah, the pre, pre-existing, uh, you know, pre-consciousness universe, or the cosmos, or post-apocalyptic non-consciousness universe, and say that that's where imagination is placed. You know, he can point there, or he'll point to dreamless sleep, but I'm pointing to this, this awaking uh, where language is on vacation, but but I'm not doing it, you know, I'm, I'm doing it now, I'm pointing to it. But in order to point to it, I have to be in the centrism of the language. I have to be using the language, right? So it's almost as if he wants us to say we've successfully left being human, where I'm going to deny my bones and my flesh are, are uh, made up of genetic uh, material that's similar to the other genetic material that we call humans. But... Um, anyway, and, and so I'm not saying that I ever become non-human, but I'm not saying that I retain that which is the definitive aspect of our humanness, which is language. Language disappears. People are capable of being people without language moving through their minds, right? And so I guess that was my point on that. Um, yeah, yeah. Anton was very um, patronizing, to be serious, in one of her comments where she had mentioned that the way he uses uh, consciousness seems to be tautological. And um, I thought that that was, you know, that was rather uh, uh, awful to hear because he's, he basically had to, kind of like what I brought up in my video, you know, consciousness can't be in an element of itself and be logically successful, right? 
and and I you know I thought I had brought that up before he then reduced it. Well, I'm not making a mathematical equation. Well, what are you doing if you're talking about sense, right? He'll just bring it right back down to sense, so we can maintain his poetics, have his cake and eat it too, bond with consciousness in terms of the uh, consciousness is time. It, it is the nothingness that is the time that you know allows us to. Uh, to speak and to negate and peer back onto the world. Well, anyway, so to be serious, says you, it appears that you're a bit tautological. And, and, and his response was something like he had to split consciousness into the stochastic and into the alertness of consciousness. Because in, and then, you, then he's successful logically because then he can say, well, the stochastic consciousness is the function of the set that allows the alert consciousness or or the other way around basically he can he can allow that and then and then he throws down this patronizing you know as soon as you can successfully uh state an anthropomorphic uh you know an, a non-anthropomorphic position then then you can speak about consciousness as if to be serious isn't above all this which he entirely is but the, the whole point is that he had to split the word consciousness notice notice that he does that right uh, to maintain the logic, but uh, okay, and so I don't want to harp on that. But anyway, all I'm saying is this: is that um, is that he, uh, yeah, he had to split the consciousness, but he also um, is is basically trying to point to the fact that you know, if you're going to speak about words, then you're speaking about speaking about words and hence you're utilizing you're in the center of the lococentrism which you can't escape anyway okay uh, as far as yeah the vegetarianism i really think that a lot of yeah if if you're gonna say it's about nerves and ganglia and it's about suffering then you got to bring it down to the gnat right you got to empathize with the gnat but i think that it's the sympathetic neurons with with animals that allow us and and their reactions to their environment that we notice and we identify we take what we call painful and we place it on them and say well this is quite obvious but i think when we say sentient you're referring to some uh, emotional interaction with one's environment in higher order animals or what we might call higher order animals i think this really has to do more with identification i think it's an aesthetic argument i think it, the argument for i think the best vegetarian argument is an aesthetic argument that we just don't like seeing this happen right but uh, uh, if you if you were to meet a a cannibalistic society where somebody honors their tribe by giving their dead carcass to them to eat or in which their enemies are consumed and where eating other individuals as well as animals is is considered uh, an aesthetic privilege or something that's a part of the culture then then it kind of rescopes the whole frame it's almost it kind of puts tool time into the whole limelight like i'm gonna i'm gonna give everything over to him right i'm not just gonna say his traditional argument you know, or the the secular argument. I'm going to give it more down to the life eats life argument, and and just make that an aesthetic argument and say, well, if you eat, you know, if you chew your nails and you eat your flesh, or if you've, you know, stuck your tongue in someone's bung for your B12 because you're too vegan B12 deficient because you're vegan and need to pull it out of a colon that won't reabsorb it itself. You know, then you're eating another animal. You're consuming. You're trading energies and fleshes with them. And um, anyway, so if the argument is about if it's about ganglia and it's about nerves, then it's got to go all the way down. But really, the argument is about the industrialization of animals, and I really think, or well, the industrial slaughter of animals. If we could treat animals like like baby you know treat them treat them really well the best of what we know how to tr treat an animal and then to anesthetize it prior to killing it to satiate our diet that would that would entirely that that would uh, that would allow the vegetarian argument to just explode 
because you don't already have a legislation that's that's put in place to anesthetize an animal, basically saying, look, these are entities that suffer, and it's a law now that we view it. It's an authoritarian demarcation that we are now to view these enemy entities as suffering. And so just the mere fact that that would be put in place, then all you have left to do is to consider the value of kind of like Barklore's last video, it's it's almost like it comes down to if an animal can't examine its own life, if an animal can't have the concept of death, which which I, I kind of think is bullshit, right? I mean, they're not planning what they're going to do the Tuesday after next, and so people want to say, well, animals don't have a concept of death. Uh, but I think that they have an interaction with their dead um, that's different than the living. And uh, I, I know that that's not the point that's being driven at, but my, my whole point, though, is that the whole focus would then be on strictly really looking and really putting into question what are the definitions of what it is we call a, a thinking entity and a non-thinking entity, an emotional entity and a non-emotional entity, and why is it that these ones get rights and those ones don't? I mean, I'm seriously wondering whether or not Gary's had a really deep cry over the Japanese people or over somebody he doesn't know in Afghanistan who died this week or, or you know, any other human being, right? It's it's about the animals, which I, I'm not... See, I'm not trying to come across as a an ethical pig. I'm just, I'm trying to break this down and say that I believe that the best, eth uh, uh, I bet if, if it's about neurons, make a, an, you know, make a, uh, anesthetize them. If it's about what is right, then quit driving your car because putting oil in the atmosphere is wrong. Quit driving it because you're killing a hundred gnats every time you drive. Quit doing it because it's not right. It's suckage, as Gary puts it, right? So I say, but if it's an aesthetic thing, you just don't like the look of it. You don't like having to go, that animal was my friend and now it's my dinner. If you don't like that, that's the best argument, I think. Um, as far as Shara, Shara, I made a video. All I'm saying with that is that if Christianity is nested in Hebraic mythology and religions and Hebraic is a, a declension or a release from uh, the Egyptian, kind of like the god Hathor is a cow god, and then the Hebrews, uh, they say, don't idolize this golden calf any longer and then they escape out of Egypt. The, the, the whole idea is that the, Engle the, the Egyptian mythology, religious mythology men, uh, considerations, these, these non-anthropomorphic gods that they had, or partially anthropomorphic gods that they had, um, uh, the Hebraic came out of that and that the male notion, the male idea that the serpent is male, that the serpent is Satan. No, the serpent if it is nested in the Egyptian, just means goddess, right? That it's the woman's god, who is an S, a goddess, is what is considered sinful. Basically, this is why I believe women are subjugated across the board, is, is from all Abrahamic traditions, uh, isn't just because of their physical... Uh, weakness or supposed weakness. I mean, there were matriarchies uh, since I've been alive, even living matriarchies. I think they're extinct now, but when I was a child, there were living matriarchies that were reported on. And that at one point, you know, that was that was the predominant uh, uh, tribal, there were tribal goddesses. Mother Earth was dominant over any masculine figure. But somehow, we said the serpent is male, and the serpent is Satan, and that serpent gave this innocent woman and then put everything on the woman, but not on the goddess, not on that which the woman praises. So I think it's a battle between the woman and her goddess and the man and his god, and that the whole idea of the Abrahamic traditions is whether you're male or female is to move you into a, ma a masculine anthropomorphic uh, deity to pray to. And, and, uh, and, and hence maintaining the woman as chattel, woman as secondary perspective. I also think it's really ironic for a woman to give birth who was Christian, when I think the majority of, of the Bible, even the way it ends, is about 
the web of life, creating life. Um, and, uh, and, and so now that you've done that, it's almost like now you can look back at, at whatever this indoctrination was that allowed you to marry and have children and kind of poo-poo on it. Just a side thought. <laughs>